Welcome to the Hebrew Read Along for 1 Kings chapter 11, 26 to 43, and this is part 5. In the last video I said it was part 5, when really it was part 4, uh, so this is the real part 5. And in this video we're going to do just two verses, verse 37 and verse 38. And then the next video, part 6, hopefully I think we should be able to finish off this chapter. Um, in this video, we're going to it's going to be front loaded with grammar. I do a little bit more grammar than we've norm, than we normally do, and I'm going to show you accordance and look at a spreadsheet as well. So if you don't like grammar, then you can kind of skip the first bit, and then we're going to look at the message and the theology of these two verses. It starts at verse 38 is a really pivotal text, and then in the part six, we'll continue on with that theme. But I think uh, 37 and 38 will be quite enough for one video. So we can begin. We will look at Shmulaf as usual for verse 37. Verse 37, 1 Kings 11, 37. Ve'otecha ekkach. Ve'otecha ekkach. And you I will give. Okay? So we talked about in the previous verses about taking the kingdom away from Solomon. And now he's turned, this is Ahia, the prophet, Ahijah, speaking to Jeroboam, and he's now addressing what he's going to give him. Vo'otacha, this is the definite direct object marker with cha, and you, ekach, from lakach, yiktol, I will give. There's your lamad right there, the dagesh. Umalachta bechol asher te'avvenafshecha. Umalachta and you will rule, you will be king, the whole over all, asher te'ave nafshecha, over all, the whole, which te'ave nafshecha. This is the verb, and nefesh is soul, uh, or at least that's a classic translation of the word. Here it really means you, you uh, um, yourself. Nafshecha with a ch, two ms, your soul over all which your soul, and this is the verb to desire, in the yiktol. Okay, and you shall rule over. You shall rule over all which your heart desires. Vehayita melech al Yisrael. Vehayita melech al Yisrael, and you will be verb to be with a ta ending. So both of this uma u malach ta. Vahayita, uh, both are two ms, katal, vakatal. You will rule and you will be king, melech, al Yisrael, over Israel. Here is our slide, the verse we just heard Shmulaf read. And what I want to focus on right now, the first thing, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this actually, is this word here, te'ave, okay? So we're going to do a little vocab first, and then we're going to look at the morphology of this verb and there's a whole bunch of verbs that are related to this, that, that are, have a similar form. So first of all, the root. So the root is aleph, vav, he, ava, means to desire. And you can see, just by looking at this, that maybe we're going to see some interesting morphology, right? Uh, first aleph, it's not too bad, but it is a weak letter. Vav, that's a mater, or can be a mater, right? Weak letter, third hey. So there's just everything here is screaming weakness. Weakness in terms of consonants that change things around. But before we look at that, let us look at the meaning. So the root, ava, this root here, uh, shows up in four words. Shows up in the verb. Ava, this is just the root listed here, all different verb forms, of course. And so our word is the verb. There are 30 occurrences of the verb. Te'ave. Um, now, and, and then it shows up with uh, three different nouns. So ta'ava looks kind of similar to this. Te'ave, ta'ava, but the vowels are different. This is a noun, meaning desire. And ava also means desire, and Ma'avayim only occurs once, uh, has a dual ending, desires. Anyway, so one verb and three nouns. Now, this is a verb, as we, as I said, and as we looked at when you listen to Shmulaf. 
Um, can you tell what binyan this is? What stem? Okay, is it cal? Is it pl? Nifal, hifil, hofal, hitpal? What binyan? Well, there's two hints here. The most important one is really this here, right? Pl doubles the second root letter. And aleph, vav, hey, this is our second root letter, and it is indeed doubled. So this is our root here, these three letters. So we know we have a prefix form, a yiktol or an imperfect. And in the prefix forms, the pl has a shava. Okay, so that's another marker of the pl in the prefix forms, um, either vayiktol or yiktol. So we do indeed have a pl here. Okay. Um, again, we'll come back to the morphology. I'm not quite ready for it yet. First, I want to just take a look at some verses where this, this root shows up. And the first one, actually the very first occurrence of this root, of any of these words, is in Genesis 3.6, a super important text, as I'm sure you know, or I'm sure you realize once you start reading it here. Vatera ha'isha, so when, we'll, we'll translate this as when, when the woman saw kitov ha'etz le ma'achal, when she saw that tov, good, was ha'etz, was the tree, le ma'achal, and this is a noun, meaning food. When the woman saw that the tree, that good was the tree for food, I'm translating it as literally as I can here, v'hi ta'ava hu, Le enayim, and that, so the second thing she saw, was good, the tree was good for food, and that it was desirable. Now this is this one here. I think I got a line here, yeah. So ta'ava, this is the noun. A little bit different than this, same. They both happen to have a tav, but this is a verb with a prefix, and this is the noun that has the tav. So, vaki ta'avahu, and that it was desirable, le enayim, for the eyes. Now, usually in English, this here is translated attractive because we're talking about the eyes. Things that are desirable to the eyes are attractive, so they typically translate that as, a, as attractive, this word here. But it's, it's this word right here, ava. And then the third thing, the nechmad. Ha'etz le haskil, and now this is a synonym. Um, yeah, I got a little note here from Net Bible. So Net Bible, the New English Translation Bible, has all these notes, and for this verse it says the Hebrew word ta'ava, this one, translated attractive, in this case, actually means desirable. Okay, the this term and the later term nechmad, this one here are synonyms, okay? So this one here, nechmad and ta'ava are synonyms. We translate this as attractive because of re regarding the eyes, but in other contexts, you'll see it translated as desirable. So the tree was desirable. It was desirable for the eyes and nechmad and desirable, or attractive for the eyes, and, desire, and the tree was desirable l'haskil, to make wise, hifil. Vatikach mepiro, so from lakach, feminine forms here with a t, and she took mepiro, pri is fruit, m is from, o is it, three of us, referring to the tree, and she took from its fruit, vatikach mepiro, vatochal, achal is to eat, we see the same root here, this is a noun form, maachal, food, this is the verb form, vatochal, and she ate, Vateten gam le ishach imach. Okay? And she gave all feminine forms here. Vatekach, vatochal, vateten. We see the tav there. 3fs, vayoktol. And she gave gam also le ishach. Okay? Isha is man or husband to her husband. 3fs. And we know this is 3fs. It's very clear because of the mapik. If you see a mapik in a final hay, uh, then you know almost certainly that you have a third feminine singular suffix. Okay, she gave to her husband, imach, again, with her, 
M is with, and ah, and I'm intentionally putting air on that because the mapik in a hay, or the dot in a, in a hay, which is called a mapik, indicates that the hay is consonantal, not vocalic. So this is not imma, it is imma, the isha. Okay. Va yochal, and he ate. Okay, so that's our very famous verse. This is the fall, right? The great fall. And it's really helpful to, when you learn a new word, to find a verse that's memorable. So now we can remember that ava, the first occurrence, is at the fall. Okay? It was delightful, attractive, desirable for the eyes. There we have it. Now, I was just running through the list of verbs or list of verses where this root occurs and... There's a couple other texts, well, one in particular, that's also very prominent that uses this, and that is the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5.21. And actually, it uses both these words, okay, these synonyms, just like it is here, which I think is not insignificant, okay? This is the commandment about, about uh, you should not desire, you should not, uh, it's, it's, it's the, it's the one that Jesus says, or that Jesus points to when he really wants to squeeze someone with the law. Someone who says that, oh, they, they've obeyed everything. You come to this one, right? What's going on in the heart? And look at it. This last commandment here about uh, your desires is just echoing so strongly the fall. That's the heart of sin, is our desires. So let's read it. V'lo tachmod eshet re'echa and you shall not chamad, okay, same word as this. Uh, here it's a verb form. Um, you shall not uh, desire the wife of your neighbor. Velo tit ave beit re'echa, and you shall not, and now we have ava, uh, the house of your neighbor. Now, this is, is hit pile, right? We got a tit there, tit ave. We still have doubling here. Hit pile is related to peel, uh, in that it doubles the middle radical there, at least in form. Um, this is slightly reflexive. I looked this up in, in Naidoti and read their article there. Um, so this one, by the way, what they said is that the peel form of this verb, which is the majority of the cases, always, with, except, with the exception of Psalm 132, always has nefesh as the subject. So it's used in that phrase, your heart desires. Sorry, not your heart, your your, your soul desires. A heart can also be used, but I think it's with a different binyamin, binyanim, or binyan. <laughs> um, but anyway, with the PL, nefesh is used all the time except that one psalm. So this, though, is, is uh, not your heart. This is saying, do not desire. And it's it's this... According to an Idoti article, it has to do with the, the desire coming from within. Uh, do not let yourself desire his house, the house of your neighbor. And then he gives a, a list of a whole bunch of other objects, right? Not just the house of your neighbor, but uh, Sadehu, his field. Okay, Sadeh is field. Hu, Ehu here is another form of the three MS suffix, like O. Um, so his field, that's his economy, right? This is his house, his where he lives, his home. This is his means of production. V'avdo, his male servant. V'amato, his female servant, okay? All his employees, his business. V'shoro, or it doesn't say v. Shoro v'chamoro, his ox and his donkey. Okay, those are his tractors, or whatever. V'chol asher l'reecha, and all which belongs to your neighbor. Okay, so another verse, very prominent, that uses ava, our verb to desire, here in the hit pile to speak about our internal desires. And theologically, both of these are just paradigmatic, right? The fall and then the command to, uh, the command to not fall, <laughs> right? That's what it's saying. Don't do this. Now, just to be complete, of course, we have two accounts of the Ten Commandments. Let's look at Exodus. 
the, the same command in Exodus 20. And here, we don't have Ava, we use uh, Hamad twice. So you can see how these are synonyms, because these are obviously parallel texts. So let's read it here. Lo tachmod beit re'echa. So in Exodus, he starts with the house. Here the house is second, he starts with the wife. So lo tachmod, lo tachmod beit re'echa. You shall not uh, desire the house of your your neighbor. Velo tachmod eshet re'echa. And you shall not desire the wife of your neighbor. So you can see how these are these two words are very parallel because it's not like Hamad is used for a wife but not a house or vice versa, right? It's, it's used here as well. And then Exodus doesn't have the field, uh, but these are the same. Your male servant, your female servant. You got the Vav there, it doesn't over here. Your ox and your donkey. And all which belongs to your your neighbor okay so all of this is to help us learn and you know become familiar with this verb or this root here and also just to see some pretty pretty important theological concepts here uh, this connection between ten commandments and the fall now I think yeah important texts this is I think this is the way to learn vocab, is by reading text, and then when you got a new word, especially after you got enough vocab that you know most of the words in verses that you're reading, if you know nothing, then it's it's tough slog, right? Because every word is is different, or it or is new to you. But once you get to a certain point in vocab where you know most of them, but you come up with a word, oh, I'm not sure what that one is. Do a search, find some key verses. That's the way to make it stick. And then it's not just learning vocab for the sake of vocab, you're learning the scriptures and you're learning what the key words are. Okay, now we're going to do a little grammar thing. And I want to show you, uh, I'm going to talk about the form now, okay? We know what the meaning is, the desire. We've seen how it exists in the PL and the hit pile and in noun forms. But there's something curious here. This is a two vav, second vav verb, but it's not hollow, okay? So compare this to ave with a hollow verb, like bo, okay? Bo, to come or to enter, shuv, to return, mut, to die, kum, to arise. There's a whole bunch of other ones. These are all hollow. What is the diff? What makes these hollow and this one not hollow? Because they're all tuvav, right? Tuvav, 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 tuvav. For a while, for a long while, when I just had too much Hebrew in my head, it was all loose little pieces, I kind of wasn't aware that a second Vav verb may not be hollow. I just assumed if it's second Vav, it's always hollow. Well, it's not. So what is the difference? The difference here is that this one is not hollow because this stays as a consonant or is a consonant. How do I know this is a double Vav, V or W? if you want to say the w pronunciation, and not u, right? It's not like shuv, because it has a vowel under it. A vowel can't have a vowel. This has to be a consonant. te a ve or te a we. In, in hollow verbs, the middle radical, either a vav, and there's some that are yud, mostly vav, is going to be a vowel, okay? So this is a holon vav. This is a vowel. It's not vo, it's o. U, u, u. And so it's either going to be a vowel in the verb form or it's going to drop out completely. So he came, katal, or perfect 3ms, is ba. Shuv, uh, shav. Mut, mut goes to mate, but the, the u is dropped out, right? And kum, he, he came, katal 3ms is kam. So, so it drops out in the katal 3ms all the way through, which is why, incidentally, when you look these hollow verbs up in a dictionary, a lexicon, the lexical entry will not be the katal 3ms because the katal 3ms will not show the vav or the yud. Instead, they use the infinitive construct, which does show the vav. Okay, so let me just summarize this here. The vav in 
in the non-hollow verbs like ours, the vav does not drop, so you're always going to see it. It doesn't quiesce. It doesn't lose its vowel. Quiesce means to lose its vowel and go quiet. The vav remains consonantal. It's not going to be consonantal in a hollow verb. It's going to be vocalic or it's not going to be there. It is pronounced as a consonant. I suppose these are pronounced too, but it's pronounced as a consonant. Te ave. The dagesh in the vav does not indicate shuruk, okay? So don't read this as u. It's not te a u e. You can't have two vowels in a row in Hebrew anyway, uh, and you can't start a syllable with a vowel other than the u. When vav, like this, this is the only case here where a syllable will start, a Hebrew syllable will start with a vowel. It's when v becomes u. Other than that, you can't have that. So this could not be a vowel here. This, has, this is starting a new syllable here. Um, actually, I suppose technically, properly, the vav, there's two vavs here, right? This one's closing this syllable and the vav is opening the next syllable. But this is v, not u. And it's a double consonant. It has its own vowel right there. Right? Now, what I want to do is show you. So, let me just show you, tell you how, the, how this came about. So, I was looking at this thinking, okay, I, I'd forgotten what this verb was. I only had a passive understanding of it. So, I chased the verb. And then it, I was wondering, why is it not hollow? Like, I knew there were some that weren't hollow, second vowels, but I didn't know why. So, I did a search for all the hollow verbs and looked at them. And that is what I want to show you in my little spreadsheet here. So give me one second. Okay, so here's my spreadsheet. Uh, let me list them by frequency. So I just did a search for all roots that have vav as a second radical, okay, second root letter. You can do that in accordance. You can search for question mark, vav, question mark in the root field, and you can get them all. So you look at them. The most common is bow, to come or enter, right? Or 2,000, 2,500 times. That's hollow. We know that's hollow. Shuv, to return, is hollow. Mut, to die, is hollow. Kum, to arise, is hollow. Tzava, is not hollow. Very common verb. And you always pronounce that vav, and it's always consonantal. So that's one that isn't. Uh, sur, turn aside, is hollow. Kun, to be established, to be firm. Rum, to raise up. Those are, those are hollow. Chava, now, chava is a special verb with its own binyan to worship, to bow down, uh, the hishta fail. But in fact, it is not hollow. The v is pronounced. Uh, hishta chave. Okay, you see, you hear the v. Uh, nus is hollow, to flee. Nuach, to rest. Bosh, to be ashamed. Roots, to run. Gur, to, so, to sojourn. Uh, ur, to stir up, to raise. Puts. Now this one, kava. Tikva. You may know the noun tikva, meaning hope. This one is not hollow. Okay? So I went through them all, determined which ones were hollow, which ones weren't. There's, I don't know how many do we have here. We go down. I can give you this, if you want the spreadsheet, just make a note in YouTube there, and I can make it available. It's no problem. Um, let's see. I'm just... Going down here to see, I think we have 170. Okay, 170 of them, okay? Let me reveal some columns here. So unhide, let's go back up to the top. He'll make this a bit bigger here. So I went through and determined which ones were hollow. So this one's not hollow, Tzava, we already looked at that. Here's some examples, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, this one is not hollow, Chava, okay. Um, this one here is not hollow. This one is, I'll explain why I labeled it that way in a moment. Ava, that's our verb, right, to desire. That's not hollow. You can see them here, we'll look at that in a second. Gava is not hollow. So if I sort these by all the ones I did, let's just go sort. I'll talk about these in a moment. These are not hollow. All these, okay? There's a whole bunch. But there's way more that there's like 27, okay? The rest of them, of well, the 170, are hollow. So most most two vowel verbs are hollow. But there's a significant number and some important ones that are not. And 
then I thought, okay, so what's similar with all these guys? Can you tell? What looks the same of most of these here? They're all, uh, let me unhide my first column here. They are all, with a couple exceptions, third haze. So let me sort here by... Okay, so we have some third ion ones. I'll talk about that in a moment. But third hay. All these guys are third hay. Okay? Anything that is third hay, any two-vav third hay verb is not hollow. Okay? In the rest of these here, none of them are third hay. Uh, you got aleph, bet, tav, whatever. You can go through the whole list. You won't see any third hays. And all the third ions are here. So what's going on? It's pretty clear with the third hay. If you have a hay as a third radical, third root letter, then you can't make the vav, evidently, hollow. You can't make it vocalic and drop out because you'd have nothing left. You've had very little left. Um, you just have the tzav or the, or the first letter, whatever the first letter is, because hay's going to drop. And then if this is soft and mushy and disappears, then you just got nothing left. Um, the other thing I discovered is that with a couple of tiny exceptions, the, these, these verbs, two vav, third he, are never cal. Okay? They're always pl. Pl or hit pl, there's a few hifils as well, but predominantly pl, where this is doubled, where it's really important to double the middle radical. Now, third ion, I also found two third ion verbs that are not hollow, and three that are. So there must be something about these here. I don't know what that's, I don't know why these are. Maybe these exist in the PL, these only in the Cal. I'm not sure. I haven't chased it. But on the third hay side, if it's two valve third hay, it is definitely not hollow. So let's, let me look at some actual examples. And uh, I told you we're going to front load this video with grammar. So if you don't like grammar, just skip this and go to the rest of it. But I thought this was pretty cool. So look at Siva. Let me zoom this right up here. I think I can go up to 400, as big as possible. I should have done that before. Okay, so Siva, Katal uh, Mass, he commanded. You see the Vav, right? And you hear the Vav as a consonant. Tsiva. Tsiviti, I commanded. One CS Katal. Atsave. Okay, this is, uh, we'll actually have this in our verse in verse 38, I believe. Yiktol, uh, with an Aleph at the front, prefix form. Tzave, you hear the vav, you see that the vav has a vowel. The vav has a vowel, the vav has a vowel. Vayetzavu, okay? This is not vayetzavu. These are not two shuriks. And it's not vayetzavv. It's vayetzavu. So the first one here is our consonant. That's the second root letter doubled, consonant. And it has a vowel, and the vowel is the 3CP, uh, or, or the, the 3MP, the third masculine plural ending, OO. So, kind of cool. You see these two, same symbol, different meaning. Vayitzavu, and they, they commanded. Mitzavacha, okay, this is actually PL participle. Again, we see va, tzav. Okay, this, this is the, the imperative, masculine singular, command. You tell somebody to command, tzav, um, tzav le David to do something, le asot or whatever, command David to do something. Uh, tzav, you don't have the dagesh there, the dagesh forty, because when a vowel or when a consonant occurs at the end of a word with no vowel or anything after it, you won't have a dagesh forte. Um, I think that's true without exception. Um, you see that a lot in the geminates, the verbs that have number two, root two and three are the same. If you have a form where there's no suffix, you won't see uh, a dagash forte at the end. So, vav is pronounced everywhere there. And in terms of nouns, uh, it's so big here, it's hard to see and uh, bounce everything around here. Okay, mitzvah, command. Okay, you hear it, mitzvah. In the plural, mitzvot. This is not mitzot. Okay? This is not a whole this looks like a holom vav, but it's not. It's vav holom. And 
uh, this is a very common word. Even people who don't know Hebrew or don't know how to read Hebrew may have heard this, mitzvot. Uh, especially if you're in Jewish circles, you hear about mitzvot. It's used in English. Um, and it, the, the, this couldn't be a uh, holom vav because you can't start a syllable with with a sh well actually no it could it could be mi mitzot I suppose but it's not <laughs> it's mitzvot consonantal vav holom tav mitzvotai okay my commandments see that a lot in the Bible okay let's do a couple more here this one chava this is the the bow or worship verb that has its own binyan uh, called the hishtafel. In the old days, they used to think that this, the root was something different. I can't remember what, I guess, shin, chet, beit, or the transposition here. These days, they regard the root as chet, uh, uh, vav, he. So double vav, or second vav, third he. And you hear it when you see it here, right? Yishtachave, uh, you hear it. Now, this is the one exception I found where the vav is actually vocalic in these verbs that are not hollow. Uh, okay. Now, this is, uh, th it means they worshipped. This is what you would normally expect. Both are attested in the text. So maybe it's just a case of dropping something. It's not normal. Um, it's the only case I found where where the vav is vocalic. And maybe, I'm just thinking about this now, this is probably not, the, this, is the, this should not be regarded as the second root letter. This is the vowel at the end of the verb, the u, and the second root letter for some reason has dropped. Yeah, I think that's probably what's going on there. So maybe I can take that green away. <laughs> Vayishtachavu, same as this, right? U, this is v-u, same, same verb form, they worshipped. Okay, so we got three of them here, actually, right? We got one without the dagash, we got one with the dagash, we got one with the vav drops completely. Vahishtachavot, okay, again, a v. Uh, to hope, this one here, tikva, to hope, that's a common word, important one. Uh, Kiviti, okay, uh, I hoped, Katal Srimas, Kivinu, we hoped, Kivva, or Yikave, Yiktol, he will hope, or he hopes, Yikavu, so Yiktol 3, three MP, they, they will hope, or they hope, so again, the Vu ending, Va Yikav. Okay, you can tell this is going to be PL because you got the Shavah there. You can't double it because it's the very last element. This one is our verb, Ava. So, Ivita. <laughs> this is tricky. This, you may look at the Aleph there and think this is Yiktol, 1CS. I will do something, but it's not because this root is Aleph, Vav, He. So the Aleph is actually the root letter. So this is Katal 3FS. And 33FS is the hey changes to a tough. It's probably the hardest form to learn, I think. The Katal 3MS, the, the she form for Katal. So this is she desired. Te'ave. This is now in the Yiktol. She will desire or she desires. Right, you got a tav there, or you, you masculine singular, because in the yiktol, the two ms and the three fs are the same, right? Talking to a guy or about a woman, or about some female entity, the form is exactly the same. Vat uh, and he desired. You hear the v there, va yit av, and. Uh, that must be the same as this, different form of this here. Vayit avu, okay, same as this, a third person, or plural. And they desired mit avu, sorry, mit ava. So this is hit pael participle, okay, 
This is <laughs> it's a good practice for me to be able to identify all these forms. Um, okay, one more or a couple more here. So this one, what does this even mean? I don't even know. Um, okay, to twist. Ayan, vav, hey. So again, we look at all these things, we see vav, we see u, same as before, we see uh, the vav, we hear the vav with a vowel uh, all, all the way through. Okay, so maybe that's interesting to you. It was to me um, helpful to know that there is this whole group of verbs that are second vav, but they're not hollow, and most of them are third hey. All the third hey, second vav verbs are not hollow. There's a couple here that are also ion, third ion, but and the most common, most important, in terms of common, is tsava. I see it all the time. Whenever you see a vav in tsava, anything to do with command, the verb, or the noun, it's always consonantal. You pronounce it, you're going to hear that vav. Okay, so we've done, we finished this verse. What was it saying here? And uh, you I will give, sorry, uh, you I will take. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, you can edit this part. Um, and you I will take so you I will take okay, edit from here <laughs> so the otaha ekach and you I will take u malachta bechol asher te Nafshecha, you I will take and I will cause you to rule, I will make you reign over all that your heart desires. Vahayita Melech al Yisrael, and I will make you king over Israel. Now let's do verse 38 and we'll go to Shmulaf and listen to him first. First Kings eleven thirty-eight with Abraham Shmulaf. Vehaya im tishma. Vehaya im tishma. And it will be, okay, throwing this into the future, and it will be, im tishma, if you listen, yiktol, shema, with a prefix there. This, In this case, it's 2ms. With te'ave, it was 3fs, because uh, nefesh is feminine, that was the subject. Now he's talking to Jeroboam. Im tishma. Et kol asher atzavecha. Et kol asher atzavecha. If you listen, or if you obey, all, et kol asher, all which, at tzavecha, okay, here's tzava, right, the most common third, the second vav, but not hollow verb, tzava. So we see it here, va, or ve here. We see this is a v, double v. And it's yiktol, all which I have, sorry, all which I will, or I do, command you, so if you will listen or obey to all which I command you, Vehalachta vidrachai, and you walk, vidrachai, derech is way, or manner, you walk in my ways, plural, because of this patach, it was singular, you would see a, a hirik there. Ve'ashita hadyashar be'enai, Asita hayashar enai, and you do what is upright in my eyes. Okay, no hirik there, so we're talking about both eyes. So if you listen, if you walk, and if you do what is upright in my eyes, lishmor hukkotai umitzvotai. Lishmor, if you do what is upright in my eyes by keeping hukkotai, okay, my my statutes, again we have patah here, u mitzvotai, again, tzava, right? This is a vo, not o, u mitzvotai, my commandments. Ka'asher asa David avdi. Ka'asher, just as, asa David avdi, just as 
David, my servant, Evid, with an E at the end, one CS, just as David, my servant, Asa, had done, or did. So if all of this, Vehayiti imach. Vehayiti imach. I will be imach with you. Uvaniti lecha vayit ne'eman. Uvaniti lecha vayit ne'eman. And I will build for you a sure house. Aman here means sure, uh, permanent. Maybe we could say that. Uh, I will build for you a sure house. Ka'asher baniti le David. Ka'asher, I like how he says it. Ka'asher baniti le David. Ka'asher, ka'asher, I can't get my tongue to roll. Ka'asher baniti le David, just as I built for David. Venatati lecha et Yisrael. Venatati lecha et Yisrael. Okay. So. We're going to talk about the theology of this in a moment. Uh, it's a really important verse. If you obey, you walk, and you do, then I will be with you, I will build for you, and I will give to you Israel. That's what God, through Achia, is saying to, uh, to Jeroboam. But before we do that, um, when I was prepping this a couple hours ago, I looked at this and thought, oh, i got to talk about this here. So a little bit more grammar or morphology. If you don't like this stuff, just skip it. Go to the next next uh, marker. I'll have it in the the uh, chapter, what do they call them? Chapter titles at the bottom of the YouTube video there. So you can just click around. So, v'hayiti imach. Now, you may be wondering, if you've memorized your, your, your promenal suffixes, why he's suddenly referring to Jeroboam as a woman. V'hayiti imach. Shouldn't it be v'hayiti imcha? Right? Look at this. L'cha. Cha is the 2MS ending. Eich, or ach, is the feminine ending. Um, here's cha. To you, to you. Did you suddenly change gender? No. What's going on here is that when cha, either in here or on a word, is in pause... It changes to ach and looks like 2FS, but it's not 2FS, it's still 2MS. Um, so here we see a fairly strong disjunctive uh, accent. Vahayiti imach. Okay, that's one sentence. I will be with you. And then uvaniti lacha veit vayet ne'eman. And I will build you. So another sentence. So this is in pause. Now I thought I would do a little search and show you this in accordance. And it's also an opportunity to show you how accordance works. And uh, we'll just look at a couple things here. So give me one second, I'll get the program. Now accordance, you see it written up here. Accordance is a Bible software. The three big ones for Bible software that deal with, um, with uh, original languages, like Greek and Hebrew, are accordance, Bible works, which is now defunct, but uh, still is out there, um, and Logos. They're all very powerful. I own all three. I use all three. I still use BibleWorks for some things. Um, I use it more for French, actually, just because it works for me. And Logos I use for um, more like a, a library. Logos and, and, and uh, BibleWorks can do all kinds of searching in Hebrew, too. But I really, really like Accordance. I've been using it for 20 years or more. And I do all my Hebrew stuff in there, or in, in terms of searching anyway. And I'm using it multiple times a week. Um, so let me show you how this works here. I'm not going to go through everything, obviously. There's all, all kinds of tutorials about using this. But I just want to do demonstrate with a search here. So they have this thing called a Hebrew construct, which is how I do all my searching. You can do simpler searches directly here, but I don't do that. I just do them all here. This is a graphical search tool, which... BibleWorks also has, and I think Logos has graphical search as well. So let's look for uh, im with ha ending suffix and see when it's echa and when it's ach, or see, or, or just see what it does, see what's attested. So we'll look for alexim. We'll type it in here. Now this is going to be small in the video, especially if you're on a phone, but you just type it in there, find the one you want. Im, okay, 
We'll drop it in here. And then I want a suffix. So I'm going to drag my little suffix thing over here. And I want to look particularly, we could look for anything, but I'm going to look for second, oops, second masculine singular, because that's what we have in our text. And there's this little connecting item thingy that allows you to say how close it is. I'm just going to say within one word, okay? I want the ha that's directly attached to uh, im and not to attach to some word that is two or three words down the road from this one. We'll hit search, and we get our results here. Now let me just move this over a bit. This is where I have all my commentaries, by the way. So our commentaries are resources or whatever. So Klein's Dictionary, Nidoti, T dot, Anchor Bible, uh, and a whole bunch of stuff here. But we're not going to do commentary work right now. We're going to look at the results. So the first occurrence is imha. Okay, let's read it here. Vaihi ba'et hahi, and it it happened or it was. Unfortunately, to highlight this, I have to have my big fat cursor over it, but um, <laughs> it kind of covers it. Unfortunately, vaihi. Okay, and it, and it happened at that time. Uh, one little thing here. In the Pentateuch, in the Torah, you will see this here, where the consonants look like the masculine singular pronoun, who, meaning he in English. Uh, so, he, vav, aleph, but it is pointed. It's a type of krekative, I think they would regard it as that. The Masoretes pointed it as he. Okay, so this is actually feminine. You can see down at the bottom, here's the roll over here, if I roll over there. You can see at the bottom that it says that's 3FS. So that's uh, something that mostly occurs in the Pentateuch. Anyway, Vayhi ba'etahi, and it happened at that time, Vayomer avimelech uvichol sar tzivao, avimelech, so abimelech, and fikol, fikol, I really pronounce his name in English, uh, the chief, the governor, the, the officer over his army, tzava, said, so Avimelech, together with his chief, said, El Avraham to Abraham Lemor, saying, okay, what did he say? Elohim imecha, God is with you, okay? V'chol asher ata ose, and, and, and uh, God is with you and all, in all which you do. And look how this is spelt, right? It's imecha, not imach. God is with you. That's what we would expect, Ha ending. Also notice, well, okay, let's just leave it that. So we'll scroll down. We got another one here, Imecha, okay. Another one here, Imecha, no problem. We're not going to read all these, but Imecha. So we see lots of those. We get down to verse 29 and we have Imach. See the difference here? So Imecha, Imecha, three syllables with a Ha ending. And this is Imach, two syllables. Im. Mach, where it's ha, not ha. It's a uh, ach, not ha. Looks feminine, but it's not. And we can roll it over here. Look at the bottom. It says 2ms. So let's read it and see what's going on. Vahi vaboket, and it happened in the morning. Vahene, he, Leia. And it happened in the morning, and behold, it was Leia. So this is Jacob being tricked by his father in law, or by his, I guess, just became his father in law. Um, by, by Laban. Vayomer el Lavan, and he, that is Jacob, said to Laban, Ma zotasitali, what is this you have done to me? Imagine his shock, right? <laughs> he wakes up and he's got a wife he didn't expect. So a big, strong, forceful expression ends, ends a sentence. Ma zotasitali. And then another sentence, another question. Halo verachel, Avadi imach. Was it not for Rachel, for Rachel, imadi that I worked? It was it not for Rachel I worked imach for you? End of question. The lama remitani. This apparently is a new word for me. Means to deceive. Why have you deceived me? So three sentences, three questions. Uh, what is this you have done to, done to me? Mazotasitali? Question mark. Halo verachel 
av, avad, avadati imach, second one, question mark, velama remitani, why have you deceived me? This one is in pause. This is the end of a question, and these are forceful questions. And so it has changed from imecha to imach. Now, the reason I belabor this about the fact of three sentences and this is at the end is because you can't really tell, evidently, that something is in pause strictly by looking at the nature of the cantillation mark. This is, I don't even know what they call these cantillation marks, this particular one. These two vertical dots, like a shava on top of it, that's a cantillation mark here. But if you look up here, um, where's the first one we had here? Look, it has it too. This one's not in pause. It's got the same cantillation mark as the one below. Why is this one not in pause? I'm guessing because it's right in the middle of a sentence and it's a statement. God is with you in all which you do. It's not the end of a forceful statement. So the mass reads knew because they wrote it. They, they transcribed the way you pronounce these things. And so they knew this one was not in pause. And so they wrote im ha. And they knew this one should be in pause. Where was it here? Verse 25, imach. So we follow them, right? This also happens with lecha and lach. So if you see what looks like talking to a woman and you know it has to be a guy, uh, check, it's probably because it's in pause. Okay, enough of that. Let's finally come to the uh, message of this text. I think we're finished with our grammar for now, okay? Vahaya im tishma. So this is that offer. This is the core of the offer to Jeroboam that God gives through the prophet Ahia. And it will be, if you listen, if you obey, here it's obey, means obey, et kol, well, listen meaning obey, follow, right? Not, not just cognitively be aware of what God has commanded you, but follow through and do it. If you obey, et kol asher atzavecha, Okay, I just note here that this is an example of two vav, not hollow. The halachta vid rachai, the asita yaashar, the enai. So if you obey, or if you listen, if you walk, and if you do what is upright in my eyes by keeping my statutes, my commands, just as David, my servant, did. Part B, the hayiti. Okay, these were all you, right? The two here is yiktol you because it's a yiktol, and these are both katals, the taz at the end, all you. If you listen, you walk, you obey, now God is speaking. What is he going to do? Vahayiti imach. I will be imach. Now this again is in pause, right? And it, it makes sense here, because you got three statements, they're in parallel, and this is the end of it, so this is going to be in pause. Vahayiti imach. I will be with you. Uvaniti lecha vayet ne'eman. And I will build for you a sure house. So this means sure and buy it, buy it. We say buy it because the Dagashleni feels the presence of this vowel and runs away. Ka'asher baniti le David, just as I built for David. Venatati, and I will give lecha you at Yisrael. Notice here, he doesn't say, I'm going to give you ten tribes. Now, he said that before, but I'm going to give you Israel. I mean, that's that's such a, <laughs> really? You're going to give me Israel? All of Israel? What's going to happen to the whole Davidic line? What's This is an amazing statement. Um, and this is even more amazing here. So, this here is a pivotal verse for the rest of First and Second Kings. God makes a stunning offer to Jeroboam. Don't miss how stunning this offer is. He offers to build him a sure house as he did for David, right? Uvaniti lecha vayet ne'eman ka'asher baniti le David, just as, just as I built for David. Like, what is he saying? He's going to make, he's going to bring the Messiah through Jeroboam. He's going to give him a house. House here, of course, means dynasty. It means a house like the house of Windsor in England. The house of Jeroboam. Wow. Going to give him a permanent house? It doesn't say the Messiah is going to come through him, but it's just, it's making it feel like it's equal. Like the offer is is equal to the offer that he gave to David. 
Really? Is that really what it's going to do for real? A sure house? Let's look at the key verse here, the comparison point. 2 Samuel 7, 16. So 2 Samuel 7 being the Davidic covenant. And we read at the beginning here, it says, the neman betcha. And uh, your house, this is the subject here, and your house, meaning your dynasty, will be sure. Now, just one more grammar note. This here is a vakatal. So it's a katal in the nephal. Um, and this here is also in the nephal, but it's not a katal. This is a participle. Um, how do we know? There's a very close. And I, I, I talk about this in my animated Hebrew video lectures, in my first year Hebrew course, I talk about this. Um, in the passive binyanim, of which nifal is one, but also you'll see this in the hofal and the pu'al, the, the participle, masculine singular participle, the most basic participle, and the masculine singular katal often look very, very similar. And the key difference is, now in this case we have a second secondary difference here, but that's hard to predict that. The key thing to look for is whether you have a comets in this position or not. If you have a comets, it's the participle. If it's a patach, it is the, the katal. So that's the one difference here. This indicates this is a participle. Just a small little thing, but maybe helpful. But the same, okay, you got a participle here, you got a, uh, because this is functioning as an adjective. I will make for you, uvaniti lecha vayet ne'eman. I will make for you a, a sure house. Okay, it's a participle functioning as an adjective modifying house. What kind of house? A sure house. Here, your house is the subject, and this is the verb. So, I will make, sorry, uh, and your house will be, it's passive, because it's nifel, will be sure. So, we have a direct echo here. The same, the same language, the same language that we have with David, and of course, the explicit statement, Ka'asher baniti le David, just as I built for David. So we're meant to see a connection here for sure. House, of course, means dynasty. Uh, I just talked about that. Now, there is one key, or one, there's actually two key differences. One of the key differences, which is uh, very evident if you read these texts, is that the promise to David, sorry, th th there is, okay, one key idea in the promise to David is lacking in this word to Jeroboam, and that key idea and the key word is forever, ad olam. And this is Woodhouse, and he gives a bunch of references here. <clears throat> so let's look at that. We'll just do this in English. <coughs> so second, <coughs> excuse me, Second Samuel 7, verse 13. David here is, uh, God is speaking here. He shall build a house for my name, talking about Solomon, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom, Ad Olam, as part of the Davidic covenant. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure, Ad Olam, before me. This is the one we read. Your throne shall be established, Ad Olam. So twice in this verse, Ad Olam. Okay, it's going to be an Ad Olam house. Actually, we didn't actually, I was supposed to read the rest of this here, and I didn't read it, but anyway, it's there. <laughs> And you establish for yourself your people Israel to be your people Ad Olam. This is now David speaking. He gives a prayer at the end. And you establish, God, for yourself your people Israel to be your people Ad Olam. And you, O Yahweh, became their God. And now, O Lord God, confirm Ad Olam, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, and do as you have spoken. Verse 26, and your name will be magnified, Ad Olam, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. Verse 29, now therefore may it please you to bless the house of your servant, so that it may continue, Le Olam, slightly different, but same concept, before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed, Le Olam. Okay? So in the Davidic covenant, in 2 Samuel 7, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 occurrences. Ad olam, ad olam, ad olam, ad olam, ad olam. Le olam, le olam. That's a 
pretty strong emphasis. If you read this and didn't get the idea that this was forever, then you're not reading very carefully because it says it eight times. Um, in Jeroboam, it doesn't say that. It doesn't have Adolam or Leolam, okay? never says that. So a key difference. Now, the other difference, or another difference, which is actually related to the Davidic covenant being Adolam, uh, I think, the other difference is conditionality. The promise to David is unconditional. If you read through it, you won't see anything conditional in the Davidic covenant. The promise to Solomon is conditional, and the promise to Jeroboam is conditional. Now, this may be a little surprising. This we just read. We saw the condition, right? Uh, if you listen and if you walk and if you, uh, if you do uprightly, if you do uprightly according to, or in my eyes, okay? But the promise to Solomon is also conditional. That's a little tricky. It doesn't mean the line of David is conditional, but Solomon's participation in it is conditional. And let's look at that again in English. So 1 Kings 2 earlier text, we haven't read these. When David's time came to die, when David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man, okay? Stuff he's supposed to do. And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. This is the key thing here, right? Walking, you have to walk in his ways and keep his statutes, commandments, rules, testimonies in the Torah. That you may prosper. That's the result. You do this, and then you will prosper in all that you do. And wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention, the red is all the conditional stuff, to their way, if you are, is the, is the requirement, if your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now it sounds like the Davidic line is contingent upon the obedience of any particular uh, Davidic king. But if you read enough of the history you know that's not the case, right? Uh, but God will actually put people off the throne. This is the whole exile. There was no one on the throne. It uh, doesn't mean the line is lost, but the fact that uh, keeping someone on the throne is conditional on the behavior of the king. 1 Kings 8, 22 to 25, another case. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread his hands toward heaven and said, Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, you shall not like a man, so there's the, the apodosis, what will happen, to sit before me on, my throne of, on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Okay, So Solomon knew. He knew the condition. He says, this is his prayer, right? Uh, he knew that he had to pay close attention to walk the way David walked in order to keep a man on the, on the throne of Israel. Another clear case of the covenant being expressed towards, I'm trying to say this carefully, the covenant being expressed towards Solomon in a conditional sense. And then finally, chapter 9. The Lord appeared to Solomon a second time, as he had appeared to him at Gibeon, and the Lord said to him, And as for you, if you will walk before me, there you go, you got to do something, as David your father walked with integrity of heart and uprightness, now God is saying this now, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your throne, your royal throne, over Israel forever, as I have promised David your father, saying, you shall not like a man on the throne of Israel. And then just to drive home the point, he flips over the coin and states the same thing in the negative. But if you turn aside from following me, so what happens if you don't obey, you or your children... You have the Davidic kings to come and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I've set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. That's the key thing, idolatry. Then I will cut off Israel from the land. Okay? Exile. This is conditional. 
You don't follow me. You're not Torah observant. I will kick her out of the land. Exile. That I have given them. And the house that I have consecrated for my name. House again is dynasty, right? And the house, the line, the Davidic line, that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. That sounds drastic. But he does that, right? They no longer have a king in the exile. And even afterwards. Um, so it doesn't mean the line disappears. But they're not going to be ruling. And Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. So, I think this clearly establishes that the Davidic, or the covenant that is given to uh, Solomon, and would be similar for the people that follow him, the kings that follow him, is conditional. And of course, it's conditional for Jeroboam, which, which we saw. And we don't, you know, we're not surprised at that one. If you obey and walk and do, then I will be with you. I will build for you a sure house just that I've built for David, and I will give you Israel. This still is such a statement. I will give you Israel. <clears throat> I found a paper by E. Theodore Mullen titled The Sins of Jeroboam, and he has some interesting insight here, I think. He says, While the grant to David contained in 2 Samuel 7, so the Davidic covenant we just looked at, contains no conditions for the establishment of a firm dynasty, this is the sure house, such is not the case in the promise of a dynasty as it is recounted within the narratives concerning Solomon. Okay, that was 1 Kings 2, 1 Kings 8, 1 Kings 9, we just looked at. This dynastic covenant, conditional in form, is in essence, so that the dynastic conditional form of the covenant given to Solomon is in essence the same promise that is delivered to Jeroboam by Ahiah in our text here. Uh, verse 38, right here. The failure of Solomon to fulfill these stipulations constitutes the reason for the division of the kingdom. That's why he lost the kingdom, because he didn't keep up his covenant, keep up his side of the covenant, and the offering of the covenant to Jeroboam. God would not have given this offer to Jeroboam if Solomon hadn't reneged on his part, right? So Jeroboam gets an offer of the covenant that's similar, at a minimum, to what is offered to Solomon because Solomon fails. So on first read, you come through here, if you didn't know anything about the rest of the Bible, you'd think that, oh, maybe God's changed his mind. He's now going to just completely get rid of the Davidic line, and he's going to just, uh, he's going to run with Jeroboam. Actually, you wouldn't totally think that because already before this, the verses says uh, he has that cloak and he gives him 10 and says he's going to reserve a little bit for for David or yeah, for David in Solomon, Solomon's son. He talks about the nair, right? So a light. So we already have a pretty strong hint that he's not getting rid of the Davidic line. But he is offering Jeroboam something pretty fantastic. And you have to wonder... Now, this is a hypothetical, of course, but what would happen if Jeroboam had been Torah observant and obedient? The history of the North would have been quite different, right? Instead of becoming the paradigm of evil, causing Israelites to sin, um, because he didn't keep the covenant, if he had kept the covenant, um, I'm assuming God would be happy with that. This is a legitimate offer. Uh, it wouldn't have erased Judah, but maybe they would have joined sooner. Who knows? Who knows what, what God would have done? Uh, he goes on, the promise of an eternal dynasty granted to David, but conditionalized in its repetition to Solomon and to Jeroboam. Okay, this is in the middle of a sentence. But what he's saying here is that there, there is this promise of an eternal dynasty, right? The Ad Olam dynasty granted to David is conditionalized in its repetition to both Solomon and to Jeroboam, as we've seen. Now, why, why is this important? For the southern kingdom of Judah, based upon the concept of this eternal promise, a future hope could be envisioned despite the sinfulness of its individual rulers. Why is this Davidic eternal dynasty important? Because it meant that there was hope for Judah. For the southern kingdom of Judah, based upon the concept of the eternal promise, a future hope could be envisioned even though its rulers fail. Okay? Contrast that with the north. 
For the northern kingdom of Israel, unprotected by any such promise, the destruction brought about by having followed in the sins of Jeroboam, of having followed in the sins of Jeroboam, which we'll see repeated again and again, would be final. So the north was not protected by the Davidic promise. Their covenant was solely and strictly and only dependent on their performance. All right? And when they failed, the south failed too. They both failed. They both go into exile. But when they failed, they... Their, their judgment was final. Israel will never be a kingdom by itself, apart from Judah. Okay, So I, I added here the, the sense of having been followed uh, or that, that the destruction will be final as a, separate enti- as a separate entity separate from the south, right? There is a coming together of all of Israel. But as a separate entity, it was that, that was it. It was an experiment that ended. Uh, now, this is a slide I'm going to end on. And we'll pick up this theme because it carries on with the next verses in the next video. But isn't this a paradigm of how we are saved, right? If we are going to depend on our own righteousness, which is not going to cut it, (laughs) then we're like northern Israel, right? Where the covenant is only going to be kept if we keep it. And if we don't keep it, then the judgment will be final eternal judgment. The southern kingdom is different. Even though the kings really, they fail too, right? But their future hope is not based on their righteousness. It's based on the promise of God, okay? If we are dependent on our righteousness, we're here with Israel and our judgment will be final. If we're dependent on the righteousness of Christ, then who is the... the, Uh, the Messiah, the promised hope of the world, then our salvation is assured. And the fact is that none of us are going to cut mustard with our own righteousness, obviously. So, um, what happens with Israel and Judah is a picture of salvation for everybody. Okay, next time we will continue, I think that is the next, yeah, part six, well, I think for sure, end this section or this chapter. And we'll wrap it up and some of this theme will continue on. But I figured this was enough for this video.